I'm John Nunn and this is another video in our mini-series looking back at some of Gambit's bestsellers. In this video I'm going to talk about Mastering the Chess Openings Volume 1 by American I.M. John Watson. This book was published in 2006. It's sold very well since then and it was the first book in a four volume series which explains the ideas behind a wide range of chess openings. There's always a problem when you publish a series of books, even if you as a publisher try to ensure a uniform quality across all the books in the series, people inevitably think, ah, volume two, that's all the stuff that wasn't good enough to get into volume one. Well, that may be one reason why volume one in this series has sold better than the other three, but it could also be because it deals with open games and the Sicilian defence. Sicilian, of course, is the most popular of all chess openings, and so it might just be that the, the openings were more mainline and more popular than those covered in the other openings. But there's also a real highlight in this book, is that the first part of the book contains a very long 50-page essay called The Significance of Structure, and in my view, this is the most interesting part of the book. In this, Watson discusses various general aspects of chess openings and how they give rise to different central pawn structures and the plans that can be adopted by white and black in those particular structures. One of the structures he deals with is hanging pawns. This arises, let me just show you an example of hanging pawns. Here, if we look at this position, black has hanging pawns. These are the pawns on c5 and d5. And they're called hanging because they lack any pawn support on adjacent files. So the black's b and e pawns are, or at least there are no pawns on those two files. So these two central pawns have to be supported by pieces. And this has both uh, advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is rather obvious that the pawns cannot be defended by other pawns and so can easily become weak. Um, even if they're not lost, black's pieces can easily get tied down by the need to continually defend the pawns and this can lead to a passive position. The advantages are that black controls more space. He controls all these central squares, e4, d4, c4 and even b4, so there's a whole a whole row of uh, squares controlled by the black pawns. So white tends to have a bit less space and the pawns offer some kind of dynamic possibilities. If black can force through the advance d5 to d4, it can drive away the knight, open the diagonal for the bishop, and in many famous games of the past, this has led to a strong kingside attack for black. Well, Watson does discuss in some detail the various plans for both sides in this type of structure. Um, and I think that's what's the, you know, the main point of this introductory essay on the significance of structure is he deals with a lot of general ideas which are reflected across many openings because hanging pawns can arise in several different openings. Um, that's not to say that the rest of the book is, is poor. He then goes on an opening by opening basis, um, giving some analysis and explaining in particular the general principles. Uh, in an earlier video of this series, I mentioned the one volume Fundamental Chess Openings, and there is a slight similarity in, in style. Watson is more concerned with um, the way the openings link up, so that ideas from one opening can be transferred to another opening. Um, van der Steren deals with everything on a more case-by-case -case basis, and of course Watson, having four volumes to play with, can go into more detail than van der Steren could. But still, the two um, books, or the one book in the series, uh, have a cover you know, things to a different depth and they're aimed at slightly different markets. Anyhow, let's just have a look at uh, a game, or in fact I'm going to give a couple of games, which uh, Watson gives, so that we can see the general style of the book. And I'm going to run through the opening moves quickly because I want to get straight onto the hanging pawn position. As we can see, it's a Queen's Indian. And 
here we have no hanging pawns visible as yet here black's taking some time to exchange off the dark square bishops which may look you know a bit slow but uh, in fact it's, it's turned out quite okay for black white doubles his rooks on the half open d file and um, after a bit of maneuvering we come to a critical moment I mean black doesn't have to advance his d pawn but the difficulty is that there's not really much of an active plan otherwise I would say that this position is about equal black could simply continue to wait and just pass while waiting to see what white's going to do but in fact he decided to push in the center and now we get the typical hanging pawn structure such positions tend to be very finely balanced it's quite easy for either side to go wrong either for white to somehow allow black to um, advance tactically in the center or to gain an advantage by another method while it's quite easy for black to misplace his pieces and suddenly find that he either loses one pawn or they become so weak that he's not able to undertake any active play himself well white continued with this move and now there's a bit of a tactical point that it looks as if white can now take on d5 but if we just play a few more moves we can see that doesn't work black has a discovered attack uncovering an attack by the bishop on the rook the rook hardly has anywhere sensible to go to can't go to e5 because black takes with check and then takes the rook and in any case even if the rook moves somewhere which looks pretty ridiculous like h5 black has the double capture on f3 regaining the pawn and breaking open white's kingside so that was a kind of trap c1 not surprisingly didn't fall into it and continued to maneuver quietly so he switches his queen across and then he switches it back again well of course there could have been a repetition of moves here but Sirwan just puts his bishop back on e2 and black puts his bishop back on d7 so we're really back where we were several moves ago and is now up to white to come up with a move other than bishop b5 and in fact he put his queen back on f4 but now with the bishop on e2 so it's slightly different he's kind of toying with black he's not weakening himself and he's just making sort of generally okay moves not necessarily terribly constructive but also not weakening in any way and waiting to see what black does what black did was to play a6 which is fine there are other satisfactory moves and we again continue with well not much going on type of play white has now transferred his bishop to g2 which is constructive in that the bishop can now target the pawn on d5 as well so black puts his queen on e6 where it provides a fourth defender to the pawn okay this is a critical moment let's just look at this a bit more a bit more carefully as i say it's a kind of equilibrium here it's hard to either for either side to come up with a really useful plan and that in a way is typical of these hanging pawn structures um, the tension in the position severely restricts what either side can do without creating a weakness and black could have just played a normal sort of move um, i quite like playing the knight to e7 it can come to g6 to harass the white queen and also possibly allows the white black queen to switch over to the b to the queen side to b6 um, with maybe some pressure later or along the b file against the pawn on b2 but a move like that knight e7 is quite sensible it's flexible it's non-weakening and it maintains the balance but black actually made a mistake here black played his knight to a5 he doesn't want to continue doing nothing and he intends now to put the knight on b3 or c4 and disturb the white rook that's probably particularly disturbing if the knight comes to b3 the rook would then have to move uh, along the rank and then there's the possibility of d4 so there's a kind of threat here but unfortunately this move 
weakens black central control and in particular allows the knight to come into e5. That in itself is not dangerous because black can put the rook on d6 but now comes the nasty queen to a4 and that really is unpleasant because the knight can't now go to b3, it can't go to c4 because that's controlled by the knight. Um, going back to c6 leads to an exchange of knights which is actually what white wants. Uh, the knights were exchanged in the game in a slightly different way but the exchange of knights has greatly improved white's position. The bishop is now uncovered so as to press on the d5 pawn and the pawn on c5 has now suddenly become weak because of the active position of the white queen. Generally speaking, if more minor pieces are exchanged, the likelihood that the hanging pawns will become weak increases. So it was in white's interest to exchange a pair of minor pieces. Now let's see what the upshot of that was. Black has to defend the pawn, but now white switches his attack from d5, which is adequately defended, to c5, which is more difficult for black to defend. So the rooks are now, all the rooks are kind of sliding across to the c file, all four rooks have switched from the d file to the c file, and this is now attacked four times, it's only defended three times. The knight is tied to the defence of this pawn, so black can't use the knight to defend it. So to avoid losing a pawn he has to push. But now there's um, more of a chance for white to make progress. The pawns are now weaker than they were when they were adjacent. There's a hold on d4 which cannot be controlled um, easily by any black minor pieces and because of the fixed pawn structure this bishop is now in danger of becoming permanently inactive. It's not yet a loss for black but it is a very unpleasant position to defend because white can manure of ages and black has no active play at all. Anyhow, the game continued. Uh, Watson discusses various possibilities um, and contrasts this with a Capablanca game in which black had the dark squared bishop. I'll just show you that position. In the Capablanca game, it was the same pawn structure with d5 and c4, but black had a dark squared bishop rather than a light squared bishop. That's much better for black because the, the light square bishop is blocked in by the pawns, the dark square bishop is active. So that here black has no difficulties in the Capablanca game. In contrast, in the short game, black has severe problems. Well, it's possible that white could have, white or, or black could have played slightly more accurately in this phase, but the general point that the whole thing is really unpleasant is absolutely valid. White manoeuvres around, Seal one's very good at this type of positional manoeuvring. And now the knight has come to a really good square. The bishop, despite its passivity, is a key defender of the d5 pawn. And when white swaps it off, the d5 pawn just drops. And after a few exchanges, uh, black in fact didn't want to face any more punishment and resigned here. He's a pawn down with a bad position and is quite likely to lose one of these other queenside pawns within a few moves. They're both very weak. So that was an example where the hanging pawns did not turn out well for black, although you can't really blame the hanging pawns for that. Um, it was more a question that black was slightly impatient. He wanted to do something instead of just waiting. The actual structure was sound, but it needed to be handled very accurately. Now we go on to another game, which is um, a contrast. And Watson is very balanced in his treatment of the various issues involved in, in opening theory. He often gives examples where one particular structure favours one side and, one, and the same structure then in another example favours the other side. And he explains the key differences which enable the balance to, to shift from one side to the other. Well, Once again I'm not going to talk very much about the opening. As we can see it's a different opening, it's a Queen's Gambit. But nevertheless, after uh, the opening play, we end up quite quickly with the hanging pawn structure. There's a difference here. Um, all the minor pieces are still on the board, which in principle should be fine for black. White can, of course, exchange the bishop for his, this knight. But in general, white doesn't really want to do this. The bishop is fairly well placed. It can come to g3 and operate on this diagonal or it can press on f6 
and retain the possibility of exchanging one of the defenders of the d5 pawn. Okay, let's see what happens. The queen is opposite black's rook, which means that the possibility of playing d4 tactically is increased. Now white puts his rook on d1 to put another piece on the d4 square. Black moves his queen to a square where d4 is again supported. And white drops his queen back. It's the same kind of plan here. White intends to double rooks on the d file and to press against the d5 pawn. We saw that already in the Sirwan game, but there's a bit of a difference here. The extra material on the board means that white has less space to maneuver in. And you can see that white has had to adopt this rather clumsy uh, plan of putting the queen on b1 and then rook on c2 in order to transfer it to d2. Karpov now played um, a clever move. It's not quite as clever as um, is suggested in the book. Let me just talk about that for a moment. White now made a mistake. I mean, there's no question that the move bishop g3 is wrong. Watson now says rook cd2 fails to knight e4. And if you look, for example, in chess bases, mega database, this game is annotated by Botvinnik, and he says exactly the same thing and gives essentially the same variation. And in fact, rook cd2 is a perfectly good move. Um, it depends upon a very, very surprising tactical point, which um, Botvinnik and Watson probably both overlooked. And, well, these days, of course, you can turn on your engine and it will show you the idea. It's something that's surprising and well, actually quite instructive. Um, there's always the question when you look at these old books, you often put them on your computer and it finds you know, flaws in the analysis, um, but that shouldn't put you off. Um, for example, Capablanca, he didn't write very much, um, but when he did write, it was very instructive. And he would explain something in general terms about the position, which was very clear and correct, but then back it up with a variation which contained all sorts of tactical flaws. It's, a, it's like he had this intuition as to what was going to work and not work and actually finding the concrete moves to back up his intuition um, was something he couldn't really be bothered with. He trusted his intuition. But you can't, you know, that's just the way he worked. And in these pre-computer days or the days when computers were significantly weaker than they are now, you'll find these books contain yeah, mistakes in the analysis. That doesn't mean to say that they're not instructive. And it can be that adding the computer analysis makes them even more instructive, but that's something that uh, you know, enthusiastic readers can do for themselves. Anyhow, let's just see why rook cd2 um, is actually a perfectly good move. Black plays knight e4, takes, takes, and now um, Botvinnik and Watson both analyse bishop takes e7, which kind of looks like it's the only move. But actually, white has a way to equalise here with the incredibly surprising move knight e5, putting the knight on prise to two different black pieces. And it's just tough to see this, because not only is the knight undefended and on prise, but the bishop is left on prise as well. But the tactics all just work for white. Um, bishop takes h4 is obviously met by a capture on d7, so that's nothing special. Um, let's just play knight e5 again. Queen takes e5 is met by rook takes d7, rook takes d7 and takes, and then bishop takes h4 is met by rook takes b7. So white maintains material equality. And if we just go back to the position after knight e5, well the final move and the best is to take with the knight, but then white takes three times on d8, again regaining the piece. And this position is more or less equal. For example, black could play here bishop a6 to exchange off his bad bishop. And after a further sequence of moves, black threatens a back rank mate. And here, in fact, um, is almost certain to be a draw. Black is, of course, a pawn up, but um, his king is exposed to checks on a8 and e4. The knight is attacked. Um, white has enough uh, play for the pawn to force a draw. But actually, 
if we go back to this position, um, while rook cd2 is actually okay, it would require tremendous tactical skill to spot this knight e5 idea I mentioned. And I think what, what I should have played, or what I might have played in this position, I think is just something quiet, h3, then the bishop can drop back to g3 without being exchanged by knight h5, because the bishop then has to retreat square on h2. And this would be just a sensible semi-waiting move, uh, which doesn't compromise White's position and has at least some positive features. What actually happened in the game was uh, White played bishop g3, and that's a mistake because Black now played knight h5, and the exchange of this knight for the bishop favours Black. The bishop can now come to f6 now that the knight's gone, and Black is once again supporting this key thrust in the centre. And we'll just see how that played out. Actually, bishop or knight can go to f6, and this fairly active bishop is exchanged off. Actually, the knight had to come to f6 now because the pawn on d5 was attacked. And black just slowly improves his position. White can't do anything that constructive. Black's position is now looking quite active. There's no real plan for white. But now there was a, uh, another mistake, although I think that black is slightly better in any case. White overlooked black's tactical possibilities here and allowed d4 in a position where, well, there's no good reply. Cautionary actually moved the knight and was left with a completely shattered pawn structure on the king's side. But let's just see why d4 actually works. After e takes d4, black plays bishop c6, attacking the queen. Queen goes back to c2, and now black takes on f3 and takes on d4. The knight uh, is pinned and it's attacked by this pawn. Even the attempt to escape by knight a4 doesn't work, even though it counterattacks black's queen. After this move, the queen is attacked and cannot remain defending the knight, so black wins a piece. So here is a case where black managed to break through in the centre with d4, activating this bishop and driving white, white's knight away, gaining time, breaking up the pawn structure or um, tactically gaining material. So these two examples show the um, bright and dark side of the hanging pawns. In one example, exchange of minor pieces led to the pawns becoming uh, weak and condemning black to a uh, completely passive position. In the other one, black managed to keep a large number of minor pieces on the board and one careless move by white allowed black to um, play his thematic central breakthrough and, well, win the game rather convincingly. There's a lot more of that in Mastering the Chess Openings Volume 1. It's quite a large book, uh, 336 pages, and the first of the four volumes, all of which contain interesting material. Um, so I hope that you'll well, consider um, buying the book if you don't already have it. And um, thank you for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you for the next one.